And here's a copy of the 1912 Higher Leaving Certificate. 100 years ago, this is what you would have been sitting. Completely different, there's three papers, two hours each. So it's a six hour paper, 300 marks. You wouldn't recognise this first bit at all nowadays. It's all axiomatic geometry. Proofs of relationships within and between shapes and so on. Paper 2, you could probably have a go at. The arithmetic would be considerably harder because you wouldn't have a calculator, plus you were using pounds, shillings and pence, feet and yards, which you'd all have to do by hand. The algebra thing would be recognisable. Some more proofs here. Paper 3 seems to be exclusively trigonometry, most of which you may well recognise. But the style changed in 1913. Still, it's not this I want to look at just now. There were additional papers that were, were sat at the same time. There was dynamics, for instance, this year. Conics. But it's this last one here. Analytical geometry. Which I want to do one from just now. Because you would recognise a lot of this. Analytical geometry, meaning geometry where you're using coordinates and calculations and formulae. In particular, number two. Number two, which says this. So find an expression for the area of the triangle whose vertices are, and you're given three general points in the triangle. X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3. In other words, find the coordinate formula for a triangle. And then the second part is just using that formula where you're given two points, but not a third point and then get an area, but you're given the area, and you have to find the third point. But since that third point can be in a variety of positions, you define the equation of its locus. Notice the wording. Find the equation to the locus of x3, y3. Where we, nowadays you would just say find the equation of the locus. Something that's not taught anymore as far as I know. The coordinate formula for the area of a triangle. Well, there is a formula for the area of a triangle if you know the lengths of the sides. I'll take a simple case. Simple right angle triangle, 3 4 5 triangle, because that's an easy one to work with. Because you know the area of that straight away just using the half base times height. Area is a half base times height, so it'll be half of 4 times 3. Whoops. Half of 4 times 3, oh, that's rubbish writing, so that's going to be 6 squared units. But there is another formula called Heron's Rule, which is a very handy one for working out the areas of triangles. You wouldn't use it for a simple case like a right angle triangle. But if you had a triangle, any old scaling triangle, like this for instance, then Heron's rule is quite handy, because if you take a triangle just call the sides A, B and C, then Heron's rule for the area of the triangle is the square root of something called S, which is half of the perimeter, a half of A oops, plus B plus C. It's S times, and then just S minus A, S minus B, and S minus C. Notice that square root would have to be there because there's four multiplying units. That would be units to the power of four, so that would be unit squared. So if you do it in the first one, it would be like this. For that first one there, the semi-perimeter, S stands for the semi-perimeter, that would be seven and five is 12, half of 12 is six, S would be six, in which case the area would be the square root of six times and then 6 minus 5, 6 minus 4, 6 minus 3, 6 times 6, 36, root 36, which is 6 squared units. There's Helm's rule. But that's not what they want in there, because it says what's the coordinate formula. So I don't really want to be using Pythagoras to work out these lengths and then putting them into Heron's formula. That'd be a bit clumsy. So what we could do instead is this. If it were the coordinates you knew in a triangle rather than the lengths, well, let's put that triangle down roughly. What you could do would be draw a rectangle around it because the sides of that rectangle would involve just direct differences between the coordinates. There are no slopings, I've got horizontal and vertical lines there. And then you would work out the ends of these three triangles and take away from the rectangle. You could use that and make it into a formula. Or, 
if you had a triangle again, you could take it a step further than that. So instead of having four parts, just have three parts by doing this. Just take the triangle at the bottom, drop that line down. Now there's three parts there. So to get the area of that triangle, it would just be a case of get the area of that trapezium, the area of that right angle triangle. Both easy to get the dimensions, just straightly from differences in the coordinates and take away the triangle at the bottom. Only thing would be to get the area of the trapezium, which is the average of the parallel sides times the perpendicular distance between them. Since you've got to do that, that would involve subtracting y coordinates and then adding those together. That'll become a little bit cumbersome. So instead of that, the best way to approach it would probably be you take your triangle and drop it all the way down to some axis, the x-axis, in which case you'd have this trapezium where those sides would be entirely the two coordinates, this trapezium, where again the two parallel sides would just be the two y coordinates, and then the bottom trapezium, which again would just be the complete y coordinates. That's the way we'll do it. So we take this triangle, and then do this part with it. Find the areas of those three trapezii. So look at that. I'll just draw them out again. We've got these. We've got this one on the side with this trapezium here. We've got this trapezium beside it here. And from that, you're going to subtract the big trapezium at the bottom. And to get the area of the trapezium, it's the average of the parallel sides times the distance right, between them. That's because if you were to go halfway along there, the dotted line, that would turn it into a rectangle with the height of the rectangle is just the average of these two. It's halfway along and then times the distance between them. One other point would be this. What happens if the x-axis wasn't there? What if that wasn't conveniently placed above the x-axis? What if it straddled it? What if it straddled the x and y axis? Would that not mess up these shapes? Because if that did straddle it, then you wouldn't get a trapezium here. Half of it would be below and half of it would be above. Well, the area of that triangle would remain the same under any translation of the triangle. If you added the same number to each of the x-coordinates shifting along, the area would change. If you do the same to the y-coordinates, under any, under any translation, the area would be stay, stay the same. So all you could do then would simply be apply a translation. That would place it above, so that this method then would be applied neatly. Right, so what are the areas of these three parts then? So area equals. Well, taking this trapezium here. So for that trapezium, it's going to be the average of the two parallel sides. That's y1 and y3. So a half of y1 plus y3 multiplied by the distance between them, which is x3 minus x1. Plus this little trapezium here which will be a half of the two parallel sides, y3, y2, times the distance between them, which is x2 minus x3, minus the big one at the bottom, so it's a half of, that's y2 plus y1, times the difference between them, x2 minus x1. And tidying that lot up, well, it's a common factor of a half, just take that out. Now it's just a case of multiplying this lot out. So I'm going to have these 4, 4 and 4, which is 12 products to write down. Now I'll put them down the order of x first. So for that one, I've got x3 times them both. x3, y1, x3, y3, minus x1, y1, minus x1, y3. Same with this one plus x2, y3, plus x2, y2, minus x3, y3, minus x3, y2. Now these have been subtracted, so I'll have to do the opposites. So minus x2, y1, minus x2, y2, we have space for this, and then subtract a negative, plus 
x1, y1 plus x1, y2. Just made it. Well, that's looking a bit nasty, but some of these will cancel out. I've got an x3, y3 there, and an x3, y3 there, which are opposite signs. They're going to go. Uh, I've got an x1, y1 there, which is negative, and I've got an x1, y1 there, which is positive. And I've got an x2, y2 there, and I've got a minus x2, y2. So half of them have gone. There's only six left. So tidy that up. Well, I might as well take them up in the order, because some are x1, some are x2, some are x3s. Pick out the x1s first of all. There's an x1. x1 times y2, and there's another x1, which is minus y3. There's the x2s. So I've got an x2, y3, and I've got minus an x2, y1. Now what about the x3s? And I've got an x3, y1, and where's the last one? And I've got ooh, minus an x3, y2. And there it is. That would be the formula. I closed all my brackets off, yes. Now the only way that that could be disturbed would be if this point, because I've got always arrange the names for one to another, was actually lower than the line of the other, then this answer would turn out to be negative. So the thing, the way that we sort that out would just be this. And here would be the formula. I've got a half of... And you could take the absolute value of. Now, it seems a little bit cumbersome still, but it's a nice cyclic order. Notice it. 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2. That's just going rounded. 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 1, 2. That just follows an order. It's a nice cyclic pattern. That would lead to something else later on. I'll put this down just now. Y2 minus Y3 plus x2 times y3 minus y1, and then on to x3, follow it round cyclically, cyclically, y2, y1 minus y2. The absolute value. Absolute value of it. That would be the coordinate formula. Ooh, I just went through that working. The coordinate formula for the area of a triangle. It's actually quite straightforward. It's quite quick. It's quite quick using that. Right, we'll just check that again with that 3, 4, 5 triangle. Then I'll go back to the problem. Then I'll mention something handy about this. It goes beyond the higher though. It's just that this cyclic pattern might suggest something to you, especially when you see an x1 and x2 and x3 multiplying differences, which don't involve the 1, the 2 and the 3, that involve the other 2. I'll back to that later. Then I'll clear this. So there it is. The coordinate formula for the area of a triangle. It may look a bit lengthy just now, but it's actually quite an easy little pattern because it's just the same thing repeated cyclically. Cyclically meaning this. I've just got one, two, and three arranged in a little triangle like this. And it just goes one, two, three, two, three, one, three, one, two. It just follows it cyclically around the triangle. So it's easy to remember. Right, just to check that again with the three, four, five triangle. If you had that three, four, five triangle then, which way I'll put it? Three, four, five. If you had the three, four, five triangle, in order to work it out the other two ways, the area should be six square units. Either just by doing a half base times height, or by using Herb's rule, that square root of S times S minus each of the three sides, the product of the whole lot, by using that. What about the coordinate formula? We'll have to create coordinates here. That's easy enough, just pick anything at all. Pick something for that point, four, five, and make that horizontal, just so it makes it easy to shift along three and shift up four. So along three would make that seven, five, and up four would make that four, nine. So if that was a problem, what's the area of this triangle? Now pretend I don't know the lengths, and I've just got the three coordinates. I would just pop into that, just going one, two, three. Maybe you can go one, two, three that way. It doesn't matter, because it's done cyclically. If the answer turns out to be negative, you're taking the absolute value of it. Right, so the answer would be this. The area would be a half of, now I know this looks longer than Herm's rule there because that was nice and nice simple sides and I knew the lengths. Here I don't know the lengths and if that was rotated then it'd be quite tricky, it wouldn't be tricky, it'd be a lot longer working out the three lengths. So it'd be a half of, just taking it in order, x1, whoops, so it's four times y coordinates, five minus nine plus x2 times Cyclically, 9 minus 5 plus x3, which is also a 4, times cyclically, ooh, 5 minus 5. 
We're going to take the absolute value of that. So it's a half of, and what have we got here? Negative 4, so that's negative 16. 4 times that is 28. Nothing times 4 is nothing. So what we've got is a half of 12, which once more is 6 squared units. Should have put that modulus in. Didn't turn out to be negative that time. That's it, the coordinate formula. Right, so the actual question itself. So the second part was this. If x1 is 1 and y1 is 2, I'll just put that down, let's call it 1, 2. And y, x2 is 3 and y3 is 0. Find, and the area of the triangle is 1. Find the locus of x2, x3, y3. And I'll just call that xy. Since it's not been used any other times, there's no ambiguity there. Here's a quick reminder then, just to refresh your memory. Well, I know what's going to happen here. I've got these two points, 1, 2, 3, 0. I've got two points, and the area of the triangle's got to be 1. Well, since those two points are fixed, I can use that as the base of the triangle, which means that if the area is to be 1, then the perpendicular distance would have to be such that the area is 1. So I could put a point anywhere parallel to that line, because then the distance is always going to be the same. So no matter which point I picked on it, it form a triangle with that base and that height. Or it could be on the other side. So the answer to this should be two parallel lines. X, Y, the locus of X, Y would be a pair of parallel lines. Right, let's see what you get, just from this formula then. So I'll put that into that. The area is one, well it's got half of it, so that area means that part inside that should come to 2, and since that's the absolute value, it should come to plus or minus 2. Then, what have we got? Just take them in order. So I've got 1 times, go to the y coordinates, 0 minus y, plus next x coordinate, 3 times, go to the next ones, the y coordinates, y minus 2, plus the third x coordinate, times, go to the next ones, 2 minus 0, equals that. So what's that all together? Negative y plus 3y minus 6 plus 2x equals plus or minus 2. Or if you like, put them into order. 2x plus 2y, I'll bring it all over to this side. So I'll take the plus one first. Minus 8 equals 0. Or 2x plus 2y. And if that was a negative 2, it would come across as plus 2 minus 4 equals 0. So the the locus would then be the parallel lines, halving everything, x plus y minus 4 equals 0, and x plus y minus 2 equals zeros. Those two parallel lines. Right, there's that question done. Or maybe I should have set that out in sable notation. x, y such that, etc, etc, x and y real. I'll just leave it like that just now.